Thank you so much for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Ahead today, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called him a dead man walking. Now, Israel has released video of Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar hiding in a tunnel. We're going to bring you a look at that as tensions in the Middle East are arising and no breakthrough on a hostage deal. Iran now reportedly capable of building a nuclear weapon within a week. We're going to hear from counterterrorism experts about how the U.S. should respond to the attacks on, an American, on American troops in the Middle East by Iran's proxy militias. Here at home, if you think prices are still going up, you are absolutely correct. We're going to take a look at the latest inflation numbers, which remain a political problem for President Joe Biden. And our Studio 5 conversation with the man who plays Jesus in the hit series, The Chosen, Jonathan Rumi. We are going to get his insights on the all-new season. Those stories and more head today on CBN Newswatch. This is CBN Newswatch. I want to begin this half hour in the Middle East, where Israel has released a key piece of video of Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar shortly after October 7th terrorist attacks and a tunnel where Israel says he was hiding in recent days. That comes as tensions in the region are rising and talks for a hostage deal have failed. Chris Mitchell brings us the story. He's in Jerusalem. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken says the U.S. is working intensely with Egypt and Qatar on a deal to release the remaining hostages and has met with their families. The agony that they face, simply not knowing, not knowing the fate of their loved ones, is beyond our imaginations. Film producer Sheryl Sandberg released a clip of 17-year-old former hostage Agam Goldstein Almog, who described how a Hamas terrorist sexually assaulted another hostage at gunpoint. Tuesday, the IDF released video of a tunnel compound showing Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar and his family a few days after the October 7th attack. The IDF also released video of a tunnel compound where they said Sinwar was recently hiding. The compound including a bathroom, kitchen, and stockpiles of food and money. While the people of Gaza are suffering above ground, Sinwar is hiding in tunnels underground underneath them. In a chilling admission, Iran's former top nuclear official said Iran has all the needed elements to build a nuclear bomb. Iran also test-fired ballistic missiles from the deck of a warship with a range of more than 1,000 miles. The tests come amid concerns of a wider war in the Middle East. And in the Red Sea, the war with the Iranian-backed Houthis has increased dramatically. This is the most dynamic uh, and what I'll call uh, uh, weapons engagement zone uh, activity that we've had over the last uh, you know, 40 to 50 years up to this point. In the U.S., a new study conducted just after the Israel-Hamas war shows nearly two-thirds of American Jews feel less secure than they did a year ago. This year's study shows us very clearly that anti-Semitism that was really just a simmering flame is now, especially since October 7th, it's a five-alarm fire. And the data confirms what we know from our conversations with, with members of the Jewish community from around the country, uh, that people feel less secure, they feel less safe, uh, and they're changing their behavior in America uh, to conceal who they are as Jews as a result. Deutsch says there needs to be a national strategy to combat anti-Semitism. Chris Mitchell joins us now from Jerusalem with more. So, Chris, why is this video of Sinwar and the tunnel where he was recently hiding so important? Well, first of all, it shows the IDF has a great deal of intelligence on some of his movements. It also reveals how Hamas leaders are hiding. Well, as the uh, rear general made the point, the rest of Gazans are living above ground in harm's way. One Hamas leader put it several weeks ago when he said, really, it was up to the U.N. to take care of the people of Gaza. But Hamas was taking care of the jihad uh, against Israel. So amazing intelligence and video that we could see Yaya Sinwar there in, in those tunnels along with his family. We were in just such a tunnel, maybe not that one, but uh, it gives you the idea of how they could hide out for weeks or months because of the kind of uh, comfort they have and the provisions they have. So far, there is no hostage deal in terms of releasing them. So Israel is going ahead with its plans to attack the last Hamas stronghold in the city of Rafah, correct? 
Yeah, so far there seems to be no holdup in that plan. Uh, they do plan, and uh, Benjamin Netanyahu has been saying this all along, uh, to get civilians out of harm's way. The White House made a statement yesterday. They said they really didn't tell Israel not to go into Rafah, but they wanted them to have a credible plan to protect the civilians, the refugees, who actually fled there. Uh, this will likely be, if it goes ahead, as uh, Israel would like, the last major battle against uh, Hamas. There's four more Hamas battalions inside Rafah. Many of them are using those refugees as human shields. It's the most sensitive area, probably, of all the campaign there in Gaza. More than a million refugees. Egypt is on the border, has its own concerns about refugees flooding into the Sinai. There's also enormous international pressure against uh, Israel to go ahead and do that. Uh, earlier today, I was in a taxi, Ephraim, and uh, he was just saying what I think a lot of Israelis are saying. They really need to finish the job with Hamas so it's never, no longer a threat uh, against Israel. And he was saying first Hamas and then Hezbollah. He also made the point, Ephraim, you know, Israelis were really living in a dream. They didn't imagine anyone like Hamas could do what they did on October 7th. Family members of hostages are going to the International Criminal Court to file charges of war crimes against Hamas leaders. What can you tell us about that? Well, Ephraim, their slogan is Hamas is Hitler's successor. Uh, they're saying humanity itself must stand firm against what they say is this global terrorist army. Uh, they say it's not just their story, but it's really the story of the entire world. And, uh, and what there's a distinction here between the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice. They're going to the criminal court, which can prosecute individuals, not countries like the International Court of Justice, as we saw South Africa take, uh, take Israel to court on charges of genocide. So what these people are doing, they're charging Hamas with war crimes, a kidnapping, torture, and sexual violence. And as we saw in Sheryl Sandsberg documentary, the sexual violence is horrific, uh, and it's just scarring some of these young women uh, for a lifetime, perhaps. And uh, so that's what they're charging Hamas with. And uh, they think it's certainly justice if they can take uh, Hamas to court for all of what it did for October 7th. Chris, Hezbollah is still launching more strikes against Israel in the north. How is Israel responding? Well, actually, that was uh, earlier today. There was a strike. It killed uh, at least one Israeli, one soldier, and uh, wounded several more. And as we speak, uh, Israel is responding with airstrikes into Lebanon. They're hitting uh, Hezbollah targets. Uh, and as we've been reporting for weeks now, uh, Ephraim, there's really an uneasy, low-scale war threatening. It's threatening to break out into a major war. Uh, Israelis know it's going to be big, much bigger than what was going on in, uh, in the Gaza Strip. But they also hope that it'll be quick and not quite like Gaza, that the, uh, you know, the, I, the head of the Israeli Air Force said recently that there's dozens of IAF, IAF planes above Lebanon. But given the order, they could have hundreds of planes. So the sense there is that they could make this a quick campaign against Hezbollah. Years ago, I was talking, I made a, had a question to Benny Gantz. He was then, uh, you know, still in the, uh, in the Army or just out of the Army. And he was saying they have magnificent intelligence about what Hezbollah has done in South Lebanon. So that's the idea that they would have massive uh, airstrikes against Hezbollah when and if this major war breaks out. Chris, Iran seems to be closer than ever to being able to build a nuclear weapon. Is this going to lead to uh, a showdown with Israel, perhaps, and possibly the United States? Well, it seems like the showdown's coming uh, regardless, uh, uh, Ephraim. Uh, certainly with Israel, whether or not the U.S. will, will try to keep out of that uh, remains to be seen. And the question is when and if Iran's going to cross the nuclear threshold and maybe even test a nuclear device. They have enriched uranium. They're on the cusp of military-grade uranium. They have ballistic missiles. But do they have the technology to miniaturize a nuclear weapon on that missile? They certainly have the motivation to destroy Israel, the little Satan, and the big Satan, which is the U.S., and they would want to use that bomb as a nuclear back, back nail to take the U.S. out of the region and destroy Israel. All right, Chris Mitchell from Jerusalem, thanks as always for your insights. Stay safe. And you know many of us back here are praying for you and the entire team there in Israel. Well, even as Iran is developing its nuclear weapons capability, its proxy militias have been attacking American troops in the Middle East. And the counterterrorism experts say, hit Iran where it hurts and the U.S. as the U.S. retaliates against those strikes. CBN national security correspondent Caitlin Burke brings us the story. 
U.S. strikes have increased on targets in Iraq and Syria, especially following the deaths of three soldiers in Jordan. Initial targets were facilities used by the militia believed responsible for carrying out that fatal attack. But last week, a mission eliminated one of the group's top commanders. Initial assessments indicate that there were no additional militants injured or killed beyond the one Qatab Hezbollah commander who was targeted. Counterterrorism experts say while the U.S. campaign is significant, the strikes aren't hitting targets that matter to Iran. The broader point here is the IRGC, uh, Iran's uh, elite uh, terrorist force, is the one that funded, equipped, and supported these attacks. And they haven't been held accountable at all um, in the strikes couple last week as well as the ones this week we didn't see any of their terrorists killed they were given well enough notice to be able to all escape back into Iran. Former special advisor for Iran Gabriel Narona compares the situation to a game of chess. They don't care how many of their pawns die um, but if you hit their rooks their bishops their queens that's when they really start hurting and that's when they change their behavior. Meanwhile, an Iran watchdog group warns the country now has enough weapons-grade uranium to build a nuclear weapon in just a week. While Narona questions that assessment, he warns that the current situation in the Middle East makes a potentially nuclear Iran more dangerous than ever. What I've learned from history is that if a country says they want to wipe Israel off the map, if they want to destroy America, we should take them at their word. And so there's a reason the last six U.S. presidents have all declared that Iran will never get a nuclear weapon, uh, because the things they would do with it are, are far worse than any other country that has nuclear weapons would ever dream of doing. Narona also worries about recent comments made by President Biden about Israel. The conduct of the response in, Gaza, in the Gaza Strip has been... Um, over the top. I think it says the message that if you attack an ally of ours and you shame them enough and you use your propaganda machine enough inside America, you can get America to back down from its allies. Secretary of State Antony Blinken also recently criticized Israel, specifically on the humanitarian toll of the war. In Tel Aviv, Blinken warned the attacks of October 7th shouldn't give Israel, quote, license to dehumanize others. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Washington. A major political problem for President Biden is not going away in this election year. Inflation still rising as the latest numbers came in higher than expected. We'll get a look at why the new report also means interest rates are likely to stay high. We've got the story for you when we come back. And welcome back to CBN Newswatch. If you think prices are high, you are absolutely correct. The latest government figures show inflation is still climbing a little faster than expected, but not as strongly as in recent years. White House correspondent Abigail Robertson reports on the latest numbers and what the Biden administration and other analysts are saying about what's ahead. While efforts by the Federal Reserve have slowed inflation, board members aren't ready to declare victory. Part of that is because the latest Labor Department numbers prove getting inflation back to normal might be more difficult than expected. We've been very, uh, very clear here that prices are still too high. We're going to do everything that we can to lower costs. New data shows the consumer price index rose 3.1 percent over the last 12 months, a higher jump than anticipated, which likely means no cuts yet in high interest rates, as the Fed hopes to bring inflation down to a 2 percent target before taking action. We're making real progress. Meanwhile, on the campaign trail, President Biden is highlighting his economic policies and hailing signs of economic strength. Consumer sentiment surged 29 percent in the last two months, the biggest jump in 30 years. Americans have filled a record 16, filed for a record 16 million new business applications since I came to office. And every one of those applications is a sign of hope. We're just getting started, folks. Joel Griffith from the Heritage Foundation, however, warns those rosy numbers are misleading. How is it that consumers continue to spend more, driving economic growth, even though they're earning less in real terms? Well, that's because consumers on average have added $4,000 per family to their credit card balances and families have drained close to 80% of their savings. 
Griffith claims American families are well aware their financial situations have deteriorated in recent years. And these inflation numbers don't even fully account for the fact that homeownership has been driven out of reach. Those numbers estimate what it costs to rent. If you're looking to buy a home, the numbers are even worse. And he blames policies from both the Biden and Trump administrations. The match was struck for this inflationary boom during the Trump administration. A bipartisan Congress pushed forward massive spending, the biggest spending increases we've seen really since World War II. And President Trump signed that into law and actually approved it. So look, the economy right now, for most families, it is rough. Griffith believes 2024 candidates should firmly commit to get government spending in order or warns we will see heightened inflation for years to come. Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Also in Washington, after failing last week, the House of Representatives barely succeeded Tuesday night in its second attempt to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas by just a single vote. On this vote, the yeas are 214 and the nays are 213. The resolution is adopted. House Speaker Mike Johnson announced the first impeachment of a cabinet secretary since 1876. The Republican-led House accuses Mayorkas of refusing to enforce immigration laws, holding him accountable for administration policies, allowing millions of illegal crossings since President Biden took office. Democrats call the impeachment a political stunt and say it's a policy disagreement and there's no evidence of high crimes and misdemeanors. The move is highly unlikely to be taken up in the Senate, which is controlled by Democrats. Still ahead, our Studio 5 conversation with a man who plays Jesus in The Chosen, talking about Jonathan Rumi. He's giving us an inside look at the new season as it hits the big and small screens. We'll be right back. Welcome back to CBN Newswatch, the all-new season of The Chosen. Season four is on the big and small screens, and we continue our sit-down interviews with some of the cast. The star, Jonathan Rumi, who plays Jesus, gives us a glimpse into this fourth season. Join me in prayer for a little while. Will you speak with me after? Is season four the most emotional season for Jesus to date? Yes, it has been. Yeah, it's challenging, emotional. Yeah, it was, it was the hardest season on so many levels for, I think, all of us. Look at these people! What have you done for them? Watching it, I mean, you are so now identified with Christ in popular culture. Has playing Jesus made it difficult to be Jonathan? At times, at times. Um, I explore this in a bit in a, in a docuseries mm -hmm. I just released called Jonathan and Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of get to see that trajectory uh, from earlier on in my career playing Jesus to almost present day and uh, yeah it can it can be it can be a challenge but it's one that um, at the end of the day I'm I'm grateful to be a part of it because it's just doing so much for so many people we're now sitting really in the middle so we've got three behind and three ahead. What's that feel like? I remember talking to you before the start of season one. My first, I think yes. you were my first official interview. Yes. Yeah. It's What's surreal, that? man. It's uh, yeah, it's a trip. I don't know. I, I don't know that I'm going to be able to, to really experience what all, all of it means until, until it's done. I'm trying to just be present and enjoy every moment of the process. I don't want to give too much away, but there's a moment that you would think Jesus should be the answer to change a difficult situation. <laughs> and you don't. Yeah. <laughs> Even some things the Father does not tell me, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think that's, that's going to be one that people wrestle with. And that is what we wrestle with as believers. Why this and not that? Why them and not me? Why me and not them? And, uh, you know, that's where trust and faith and surrender uh, come into the equation of, of the spiritual life. You told us it would be like that with how you lived. Episodes of The Chosen are in theaters right now. Episodes seven and eight, the final two, will make their run in theaters beginning February 29th. 
Be sure to join us tonight for an all new episode of Studio 5. We're going to take a look at the latest installment of the National Geographic Genes Genius Series. It is called MLKX. It explores the lives of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, along with their wives. We are sitting down with the actors who play Coretta Scott King and Dr. Betty Shabazz, along with two pivotal producers of this series. You can watch the all new episode of Studio 5 tonight on the CBN News Channel it begins at 8. You can also watch it on the CBN News app or on YouTube. As you undoubtedly know, today marks Valentine's Day. And in just a moment, we're going to bring you a look at the world's tallest Valentine. And it's a very tall one indeed. You may be surprised at how big it really is. We're gonna have that story for you when we come back. Stay with us. It's Valentine's Day. Husbands, wives, boyfriends, girlfriends of all ages are sending each other all kinds of Valentine's cards and presents, many of which are traditional and some may be a little out of the ordinary. But one of the most remarkable of all is the world's tallest Valentine. It's a display on the 60-story Paramount Miami World Center skyscraper in Miami. The structure is 700 feet tall. It's glowing with an enormous display of kissing lips, floating hearts, and cupids flapping their wings. The center column includes the world's tallest rising red rose, and it tops off with a bouquet above the building's 300-foot-wide rooftop. A team of 12 technicians spent three years designing and then installing the $3 million lighting system. Happy Valentine's Day to you. Well, time now for your Wednesday word, and today's word is healing. Know this, God is a healer with a heart for all, your body, your mind, and your spirit. Your mental health is just as important as your physical health. God wants you healthy, and he wants you whole. It's why he sent his son to die and his Holy Spirit to guide and comfort. Receive both, and your life will indeed be better, and you will indeed be whole. That will do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. You can always find more of our news programs on the CBN News Channel at any time, as well as online at CBNNews.com. Thank you so much for watching. Happy Valentine's Day. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Goodbye and God bless.